Okay, so thank you, Martin and other uh, organizers for asking me to speak here. Okay, this is a small change in the title. Uh, I'll speak about the relationship between adaptation and disease. So I realize that there's a very broad audience. So I will not, uh, you know, I'll keep the discussion at a very qualitative level. But if you're somebody who likes formulas, proofs, and stuff like that, this is where you can find it. Okay, and uh, I'll also fo follow Suman in the sense that, uh, you know, you don't have to wait till the end to ask questions. So I like it when you ask questions during the talk. And I do have a tendency to speak loud and fast. So please slow me down. Ask me. OK? So I'll, you know, I'm very comfortable if you ask me questions in between. OK. So I'm a uh, statistical physicist by training. I do theoretical physics. And uh, for last several years, my work is focused on population genetics, which is a theory a theory to explain how evolution works. So I'll try to tell you how, what's the relationship between evolution and disease. And, uh, you know, as I said, ask questions if something is unclear. Okay, so we already, all of us have some idea about what adaptation is. So you're thinking of a population which has a low fitness. And fitness can mean many different things. It could be, for example, the probability to survive to a certain age. It could be the reproductive success the number of offspring produced, and so on. So it's, a, you know, different measures of what fitness is. So what one is thinking about is a population which has a low fitness right now, and then it acquires certain mutations so that it fitness, its fitness increases over time. And of course, evolution is a fact, and this is, for example, for a certain experiment in which fitness increased over time. Okay, so that's fine. But what are these mutations? It is a very basic thing, which we should just get it clear right now which is the following, that when, the, when uh, these, the, these mutations are not necessarily only beneficial ones. Adaptation is not driven only by good mutations. Both type of mutations occur. They are good mutations as well as bad mutations. So let me revise what I said in the beginning. Adaptation is therefore, is the net increase in fitness, okay? So there are good mutations which would allow the population to survive, but there are also bad mutations. And these bad mutations are the ones which may be associated with the disease. So this is a sort of intimate connection, relationship between adaptation and disease is what I would like to uh, convey today. All right? Okay. So let me give you several different ways this can happen. So let me give you this classic example. I'm sure all of you have seen it somewhere or the other. So here is this you know, map of Africa. And these dark portions are the ones where malaria is endemic. What was realized in actually in 30s, 40s by Haldane and then several people worked on it, is that in the same regions, there also a higher prevalence of sickle cell anemia. So what is this correlation between these two uh, diseases, right? So what was realized later on is that if, uh, if uh, that the, a mutation has happened, which if it's present in a heterozygotic form, it causes sickle cell anemia, but it also offers resistance to malaria. So there is an adaptation to fight off malaria, but you also carry this burden of another disease that is sickle cell anemia. And this prompted this person, Alison, who has worked a lot on this, to say even that disease is an agent for natural selection. Okay, so this is one example in which you have both adaptation and disease going hand in hand. There's other mechanisms as well. There's another one here in which there are certain genes they can control several states at the same time. Also, they can have positive as well as negative fitness effects, right? So there is certain genes, some BRCA genes, some something. So it is a good one. It increases the reproductive success, but it also causes cancer. So if you measure fitness as reproductive success, that's adaptation, but you also carry this load of the cancer disease. And it turns out that the costs are uh, lower or the benefits are higher at an early age because you want to survive, you want to live, you don't want to get a cancer at an early age, right? So the, the benefits are high at, low, uh, at early age and the, the cost increases later on. So then there is a trade-off which allows one to have adaptation, but you know, you carry this burden along as well. Okay, and here's one more different mechanism which tells you relationship between adaptation and disease. So here's a little cartoon. So I'm thinking of, uh, so each of these lines with the circles represent an individual 
It represents the sequence of an individual. So this is the first individual, second, and so on. And the black circles represent bad mutations. And in this population, let's say at some point of time, a green mutation happened, which is good for it. It's a beneficial mutation. Then, if this population is asexual, it does not have any genetic mixing, then after selection, what would happen? See, this is a good mutation, right? It's good for health. If the associated deleterious mutation, the bad mutation is not too bad, then this bad mutation drags along with the beneficial mutation. And that gets spread. Do you see the difference between these two pictures? I have both black ones and the green one. But after selection, this guy and this one, that's what you would see at the, after selection. This is called genetic hitchhiking. The bad mutation has hitched a ride along with the beneficial one. In that sense, the diseased one is lurking behind the scenes. It's there, okay, along with the beneficial one. Okay, and this has been, again, documented for several diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases and so on. I mean, so you can find these uh, more details in uh, these kind of reviews and other uh, places. But the key point I want to make here, yeah. Yeah, so, right. So there, there I gave you an example of, let's say, humans. Now we are talking about uh, asexuals. That's one thing. But otherwise, also, mechanisms are pretty different. Okay? There's an age and all that there. But now there's no age. This is just after one generation. Okay. So the key point that I want to, and this is the one I'm going to focus on the rest of the talk. So get it clear right now. Okay? So the idea here is that if I have an asexual population, a good mutation occurs, then because it, is, it has a chance, you know, it will produce more offspring, it will, you know, uh, has a higher reproductive success, then the, the bad mutations which are physically linked to it, they will get dragged along. So therefore, this is true in an asexual population. But you expect that when there's a sexual population, that is, there could be recombination, there could be horizontal gene transfer, or whatever it is. Let's just call it genetic mixing. If genetic mixing occurs, these associations can break down, okay? These associations can break down, and therefore this problem of genetic hitchhiking is really for the asexuals. And now I said asexuals, you know, don't worry about humans, but that's not really true. There are parts of your human genome, uh, uh, the, the, the Y chromosome, the male sex chromosome, that is actually asexual, okay? So therefore, and it has degenerated because of this reason. All right, so therefore we have to be careful here. There's an asexual populations, they carry this burden of deleterious mutations a lot. So that's a set of basic, simple concept that you have to keep in mind. Is this okay with everyone? Hmm? Okay, good. Okay, so, so like I said, you know, since uh, it's a broad audience, I will uh, start with some basic pop gen, and I'll tell you some basic fundas, and, uh, you know, because they are pertinent to what I want to say later on. Okay, so let's go through that. Okay, I'm going very fast. <laughs> okay, so these are the basic evolutionary processes. So, you know, we'll take the sort of a physicist kind of approach, which is that, you know, we have these uh, basic forces, if you like, and people have categorized them over the more than a century of evolutionary studies. So these are natural selection, mutation, and there are two more. Everybody here understands what is natural selection is. Everybody understands? Raise your hands. Anybody who doesn't know natural selection? Okay. Mutation, everybody knows. What is mutation? Yeah. So it's a change, not necessarily sudden. It's a certain rate at which mutations occur. Okay? But, so this is something you have read a lot in, you know, popular science articles that evolution is driven by selection and mutation. But what is not realized is that evolution is a stochastic process, okay? So there is a lot of stochasticity there. And the technical word for it is called random genetic drift. Okay, this is going to be important. So please uh, do keep this in mind. And then there is a sort of broad category which goes under the name population structure, which says that, you know, is, is this a well-mixed population or is it like there is a population on this island and then there's another one which is on another island and so on. So that's a structured population. So those things are sort of added into this last category. 
And the population genetics is a, is a framework which says, if I give you these forces, how is the gene frequency? The genetics are coming into play here. How is gene frequency going to change with time? Or maybe, maybe even at large times, one can talk about stationary states. So those are the kind of questions that one is interested in answering uh, in this framework. Okay, so natural selection, everybody said yes, we know it. Okay, let me make sure. So I'll just give you a very simple model here. So this is like a really old, you know, early 90s. So where one, what one is saying is, one is thinking not of this very complex genome where are there are good mutations, bad mutations, and each of them has different effect, etc. But it's just focusing just a part of genome. Because, you know, in the early 1900s, we didn't even know that we have a genome, right? So, when is this thinking that, you know, I'm going to represent your DNA, whatever it is, by just a single blob, an open circle or a closed circle. The wild type, the common ones, I'm going to denote by, let's say, the filled circle, and everybody else, which is different from it, is a mutant, which we will denote by this open circle. These are called one locus models. They are very simple models, extremely simple, and a lot of work has been done in the last century in understanding these simple models. And you know, since we are doing the basic pop gen, this is ideal for that. So what one does is to assign some fitness to it. As I said, you know, fitness means different things. So you can assign some number to it. Uh, let's say one plus s here for the dark one, and for the light one, it's one. And then you calculate the frequency of that. If there's only selection, if I interpret that as the number of offspring produced per generation, there's a sort of trivial equation that you can write down. So I'm asking, what's the frequency at time t of these dark ones that simply changes in the next generation if I just multiply by its fitness? The population frequency is going to increase exponentially with time, right? So that's what you expect. So what will happen at large times? If s is positive, that means the dark allele is better than the lighter one. What do you guys think will happen at large times? Is there a winner or a loser? Or does not matter? What do you think? Sorry? Yeah, the dark one will win if it is a better one, right? So that's the sort of intuition you have. That it's selected, it's better, it's selected. But just wait, because this is going to change a little bit in a few minutes. Okay, so that's the sort of, uh, you know, intuition. That was for the selection, but there's also mutation. As somebody said, it's a change. So the dark one can become light one, light one can become dark. And mutation and selection, they are sort of opposite processes. Selection has a tendency to select the good one. Mutation is sort of more democratic process. It says, just change them around, just throw them around. Okay, so they act in the opposite manner. And if you're a physicist, this may, you know, you will immediately think of something called phase transitions. And indeed, in these models, people have found some sort of phase transitions as well. Okay, but this is a one process. Okay, but now, let me come to stochasticity, which is, goes, as I said, is called random genetic drift. But let me first motivate to you why it's coming. So suppose I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say a bacterial population, and I have this petri dish, which has the food just for five microbes, just for the five bacteria. So there are these dark good ones and the three bad ones, perhaps. Okay? Then reproduction happens. Each of them divides. Now I have got 10 such cells. But you know, there is a finite carrying capacity. We, the, all the 10 cannot survive. So half of the population has to die. How does that happen? How do we do that? So maybe, you know, you will say, yeah, but this is a good one. It should survive. That was the intuition we had, no? The good ones should be get selected. The fitter one should survive. Yeah, but you know, this guy was going to food and maybe lightning struck it or something like that happened. So those kind of stochastic events one would like to take care of. So what one can do is to throw a dice and ask dead or alive, dead or alive, till you get all the five particles in the, or five individuals in the system. So the, a reasonable way to do it, however, is not simply throw a dice. They're not equally likely to be chosen. The one which has a higher fitness has a higher probability to survive. So what one can do to make this generation is to throw a dice, but it is biased in the sense that if this is fitter, there's a more likelihood for it to survive, but you have to throw a dice. That's a stochastic evolution happening. That's how you're going to add stochasticity to your model. Is this okay? 
Okay, so one can you know generalize these things, and this is the basic uh, thing that you have to keep remember in, the, in your mind that you have to throw the dice to form a new generation. Okay, and there are some sort of standard processes, etc. One could run. So I'm not going to the details of that. Okay, so suppose I had again there are these five individuals. Maybe there was this dark one which was good, and then maybe it produced three offspring. So I'm not thinking necessarily for bacteria which divides into two. It, it could be any number of offspring it can produce. So it's not necessarily bacteria. It's a, it's a model, and it's a pretty general model. So it produced three because we threw some dice, and maybe this had two, and you know, they just uh, uh, could produce offspring and so on. Okay, so this is, has a name for it. It's called Wright Fisher process, which is a standard population genetics model. Okay, so now let's ask what does this stochasticity do? It's very well to complicate matters and you know, life makes, let's make our life hard. But what does it do? Does it achieve anything? What does it do? So let me ask this question. Suppose this population initially had this dark one, which was a good mutant. It had a higher fitness. So what do you expect? You said that, you know, since it's a better one, it should have more offspring. So it produced three, and this one produced two, because better, it produced three, and so on. And so at some point, if no more mutations happen on the way, you expect all five will become dark ones. Everyone happy with that? Is that what you would expect? Yes or no? Yes, yeah, good, right. But don't forget, we threw dice, right? So maybe they had three offspring, but in the next generation, it so happened that these two reproduced, and they produce offspring, and maybe this is reproduced, and so on, and so on, and all of them became the light ones. It's not the fitter one which won. The less fit one can also win. The population might have the less fit one as well, and that's the consequence of stochasticity. Okay, so this is, if nothing else, you should take this little lesson home. So, is it okay with everyone? Good. So therefore, one can ask, if I run the simulation or something lots of times, what's the chance that this dark one would spread in the population or fix in the population? So the technical word for that is fixation probability. One is asking, what is the probability that this dark one, which is a rare mutant, it just arose today, after a few generations, I will still see it in the system. It has spread through the population. And one has to calculate it. And this is a basic building block if you want to uh, build stochastic models of evolution. Okay, so this is the quantity that you have to calculate. How does one do it? So there are a couple of methods that one does it. So I'll just sort of mention them. I will not, you know, do the calculations here. So there is something called backward Fokker-Planck equation. So physicists, mathematicians are very familiar with those things. So uh, basically, one writes on a differential equation, which is a PDE. And when asked, what, there's some deterministic term, which does not have stochasticity. Physicists call it a drift term. And then there's a second term, the so-called diffusion term, which carries the stochasticity into account. And then one has to solve this equation. And uh, you know, if uh, you have sort of simple models, one can make progress with this. And this is one standard method that people have used quite a lot. But it doesn't take you very far, unfortunately, because it's a PDE, and you know it's very difficult to actually analytically solve it. A more fruitful approach is called branching process. It has its own limitations, but you know it takes you still farther than the first one. So I'll just tell you what the idea is. So the idea here is that I had a large population of the light ones, and then this dark one arose at time t. And let me ask what's the chance that it, it, uh, it gets extinct eventually. So I just want to write a little recursion relation for that. So the idea there is that this probability is that if there was no offspring, then of course it goes extinct. Suppose there was one offspring, then that lineage should go extinct. Suppose that to three offspring, all three should go extinct and so on. So if you add up all of that, that gives you a recursion relation for this extinction probability. Okay, so that's all there is. And you know, when we are doing more complex models, we have to sort of change this a little bit, and it's possible to make much more progress. But this is the basic, uh, uh, basic, fun, uh, basic uh, idea here. Okay, so one could use these things. Okay, fine. Okay, so the model that I said earlier, in which we had this uh, lots of light-colored ones, 
and a single dark one comes, what's the chance that it spreads? As I said already, it could all could become dark or all could become light. So let me ask, what's the chance that the dark one spreads? So that formula is a classic formula in population genetics, and uh, it's known since 62, 1962. So if the wild type fitness is 1 and the mutant fitness is 1 plus s, we get this complicated formula. 1 minus e to the power minus 2s by 1 minus e to minus 2 n s. It's a little complicated. So if this mutant was a better mutant, then as the population size increases, the probability decreases. Okay? And it saturates to a constant. But this constant is less than 1. That is, the chance that in a large population, a good mutant fixes is not sure, it's not for sure. It has a less than one probability of getting fixed. In other words, a beneficial mutation can get lost. Similarly, if it were a bad mutant, that is S is negative, there is a very tiny probability, but nonetheless it's zero, it's non-zero. The deleterious mutant can get fixed. Right? And similarly, you can talk about neutral ones, which is uh, some, some simple answer. Okay. So this is a sort of a basic idea. Beneficial mutations can get lost, and deleterious can, can get fixed when you take stochasticity into account, when you take the finite size of the population into account. And there's one later result only which I want you to remember because it'll keep coming, which is that a beneficial mutant in a large population fixes the probability, which is just twice the fitness advantage it has two times s, which comes from here, and other calculations as well. Just keep this little formula in mind. Okay. Okay, so, fine. So we are done all, all with the introduction, and then let me now really make things even more complicated and complex. So now I want to think now of the whole genome, which has lots of sites, lots of loci, and these loci could have good mutations, they could have bad mutations. Some good mutations are very good. That means they S, the, you know, with respect to something, the selection coefficient or the selective advantage is different. It is high for some ones, some, for some other ones it's low and so on. So, okay? So I want to now think of an asexual population which has a long genome. There are good mutations and bad mutations. And I want to understand how these deleterious mutations affect Adaptation. Okay? So, uh, so this model is, as I said already, I'm thinking of an asexual population. It has a finite size n. It is a sequence with a large number of sites. A beneficial mutation occurs at a certain rate, ub, and the deleterious one has a rate ud, so b for beneficial, d for deleterious. And every time a beneficial mutation occurs, it increases the fitness by an amount sb, and deleterious one decreases the fitness by an amount st. Okay, so there are five parameters in the model, and we can ask lots of questions, but here I'll focus on, on one question, which is, what is the fixation probability in this model of a single mutant, okay, which has an effect sb, that is, it increases the fitness by an amount sp. Okay, right. Okay, so the answer is slightly complicated, so we'll not bother about that. I'll tell you only, a, so I'll only show you a picture. And let's just try to think a little bit along. Okay, so the answer about this fixation probability depends on how strong the deleterious mutation is and how much is the mutation rate. So let me explain. So let's take case one, in which when a bad mutation happens, its effect is very bad. So I have this genome of you know, five individuals, six individuals, and some of them carrying this red mutation, which is a bad one. It's so bad that basically you are almost dead. It's an almost lethal mutation. Let's take a limiting case, like physicists like to do, right? So it's a pretty bad mutation. So therefore, you will not see it. It will not be there too much of it, right? So most of the mutation, most of the individuals, therefore, will not carry this deleterious mutation because its effect is so bad. Selection will prevent that, right? But now, if a good mutation happens, if it happens with this individual, do you think it will spread? Okay, I got one answer. Yes, good. So, it will not spread because, you know, this guy is not so, this guy is really bad. So, how can it spread, right? Okay, so it better arrive in an individual which does not have these bad mutations, right? And therefore, 
you know, at, after selection, after some time, basically everybody would carry these mutations and the, the bad guy is gone. This is very similar to this one low-cost model I spoke about, right? I didn't have to worry about the whole genome, it's basically that site, right? So that's why these one low-cost models, we say they are simple, they have limitation, hoo-ha, but they are good in a certain parameter regime when we are looking at more complex models, so don't throw them away, okay? And there we learned that the fixation probability was twice the fitness advantage, so that's what we have. So in this case, when we have a bad mutation is really bad, then the chance of fixation of a good mutation simply is twice the fitness advantage, and this comes out of math, which I haven't told you. So this is the condition under which this happens. Okay, so this was a really bad deleterious mutation. But deleterious mutations, as well as beneficial mutations, they can have different sizes. That means they could be really bad or mildly bad, and you know, mildly good and really good and so on. So let's look at now the weakly deleterious mutations. So they are weak, that means that, you know, they are bad, but not so bad. So then there will be quite a few of them. Everybody will carry some of these mutations. You know, they have not been purged out by selection. Now, green mutation, the good mutation has no other, you know, way it has to come with the deleterious one. But if the mutation rates are low, then, you know, these ones can go away. And then, uh, uh, mutation rates are low, then not too many deleterious and not too many beneficial mutations will come. And then, just like the previous picture of hitchhiking, this guys, these two guys will spread in the population. This picture is more or less similar to the previous one, more or less, okay? And again, in this case, it turns out under these conditions, the fixation probability is approximately twice the fitness advantage. So now it's getting a bit boring, right? So let me show you something a little bit more exciting now. Now again, weakly deleterious mutations. All, you know, mutations are bad, but not so bad. But mutations are pretty high. So you have these mutations, and then a green mutation comes, but they're all pretty bad in the sense that there are lots of deleterious load, right? And as the population is evolving, more and more are coming because mutation rate is high. So in that case, remember what I said, ad adaptation is net increase in fitness. So if there's too much burden, this green mutation may not be able to survive. Its fixation probability can become zero, okay? So that happens under certain conditions, okay? So that's the sort of basic message I want to give you, that if mutations are deleterious, mutations are quite weak, and mutation rates are high, adaptation would suffer, the, pro the uh, population may not be able to adapt. On the other hand, if deleterious mutations are weak, but mutation rates are low, population would adapt, but we will drag along these bad mutations as well. That's a sort of two-line message. Yes? No, the, uh, both mutations scale the same way. Yes, it will come. So if that comes, hmm. then as long as the sum of green dots is greater than the sum of your red dots, it will have yeah. a Yes, yeah, so yeah. Yes, so, the over there is equal, right? yeah, so, yeah. So I will introduce more ones. I'll come in a minute. But uh, more precise conditions are these. More precise conditions under which this scenario holds is the, are these, okay? So I haven't told you all these details, so just keep the picture in mind. Okay, so let's move on a little bit more quantitative. So this is all talk, talk, talk. Let's see what we actually get. So I run this model, do numerics, I do calculations of this branching process, and this is what I get, which is what I just said. That if mutation rates are low, this is for weakly deleterious mutations, if mutation rates are low enough, the fixation probability is close to 2s, as I said, but there's a, if it's large enough, it's approximately zero. There's a transition in the behavior of the fixation probability as I increase the mutation rates, okay? And, uh, you know, this is the same sort of picture again. Again, as I said, 2s, 2s, if mutation rates are low or high, but selection is strong, the selection is weak, again, fixation probability can become zero. So point here is that when you have these models, the picture for the fixation probability is rather complex. It depends upon certain parameter regimes, okay? So uh, that's all I wanted to say here. Okay, so now let me go to Sutheed's point. So he is saying that, you know, uh, 
if you have a population which has a high mutation rate, deleterious mutation rate increases, but biologically what's true is that the beneficial mutation rate also increases. So lots of red, red mutations coming, lots of green mutations are also coming. So isn't that great? It turns out not really. So this is the phenomenon of called clonal interference. So the idea is this. So I'll think in terms of population size, but you can also think in terms of increased UB. Okay, so the idea here is this. Suppose I had a population which was uh, nicely, you know, uh, hanging around, it had spread into the population, the red one, and uh, a new one came, which is the blue one, and it was better than the red one, okay? But it takes time to fix. The fixation time is longer than the time during which the new mutations arrive. Then, before the blue one could spread in the population, another one, the pink one might arise, and the blue one will get lost. That's a waste of beneficial mutations. There's a beneficial mutations, they are competing with each other. So the blue one is good, but you know, it got outcompeted by an even better one. Okay, and this is something we just seen in experiments as well. So, these are the two effects that we have to, okay, sorry. So, uh, you know, people calculate something called speed of adaptation. It turns out that this competition has a very drastic effect. If there's no competition, then the rate of adaptation or the speed of adaptation increases linearly with the population size. When you take this into account, it decreases a lot. It's just logarithmic. Okay, but uh, coming back. So adaptation, therefore, to summarize, slows down due to two reasons. The first reason, which I suppose is you know, more pertinent to the discussion, through this discussion meeting, is the burden of linked weakly deleterious mutations. If these deleterious mutations have a weak effect, selection cannot purge them, and the population is asexual, you have to take them along. The burden stays. And the other one is the competition with superior beneficial mutations. In either case, speed of adaptation decreases because of these two uh, uh, effects. Okay, and there's a little uh, phase diagram, if you like. So where I have plotted the mutation rate, and this is the population size. If you don't like a population size, you can plot UB, for example. So there are these four sort of regions. There's a region in which, you know, uh, there's no interference by either of them. This is the one where, is, where adaptation occurs, but you carry the disease along. These two are the regions where beneficial mutations are also not good. They compete. And then there's a region in which both types of mutations interfere and therefore slow down the adaptation. Okay, so I'm basically done. So deleterious mutations, which here I mean disease, they can hitchhike with the beneficial ones, which, is the adapt which are the ones which drive the adaptation process, but that happens in the absence of genetic mixing. That means uh, no sex, no recombination, no horizontal gene transfer, etc. Okay, and this effect is particularly there when we have deleterious mutations of weak effect and the mutation rates are high. So one way uh, one could break these associations is by recombination, but how much does it do, uh, you know, to what extent it does, that is not understood. I mean, you can write models and stuff like that, but it's pretty complicated, it's very difficult calculations. So that's something which is not understood, but we expect that recombination would uh, help. It will help to break these associations and therefore increase the speed of adaptation. But how much it does, it does, it does is not clear. Okay, so I think I'll stop here.